Wherever you're watching from, welcome, share the video, welcome, share the video, share the video. Let many people join us. God bless you. Let me know if you can hear me very clearly. Let me know if you can see me very clearly. And don't forget to tag someone in the comment section below. Let them know the senior prophet is live for the truth of the death prophecy. God bless you and uh, welcome once more uh, wherever you're watching from. It is uh, uh, a privilege to uh, have you here. And I tell you that uh, your life will never remain the same again. Your life will never remain the same again. And uh, wherever you are, I want you to share the video and uh, tag someone in the comment section below. Uh, this is a very uh, uh, critical moment that uh, I, I respond to uh, or the prophecy that I, I made earlier uh, today. Now, before I start, make sure you have shared the video and make sure that uh, uh, as many people join us, uh, you're going to tag somebody in the comment section below. And as well, you're going to uh, you know, share with our neighbors and with your friends on Facebook, I tell you, your life will never be the same again. I believe that every time I show up, it is the time for someone's blessing. It is the time, or it is an opportunity for so somebody to connect. And I believe you mean that uh, today somebody will be liberated. Now, uh, let me start by saying it is very much important to understand who is a prophet. 
you know, who is a prophet. And also, it is very important to understand that uh, what's God's mind on a prophet when God looks at somebody who is called as a prophet? How does he look at him? And the place of a prophet in the realm of the spirit or in the kingdom of God. It's very much for you to understand that. Otherwise, we celebrate things that look like they're from God, but they are not from God. And that's where many people make errors. Now, uh, earlier today, or this morning rather, around 3 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m., the Spirit of God took me to a place of plainness. And as, this, as I walked, uh, there was a house. There was a house. And the Spirit of God took me to that house that looked like there was a funeral ceremony. But that funeral ceremony there, it looked like it was to be carried, okay, to another region. So, the Spirit of God said to me, I'm referring to the Spirit of God or an angel of God is the same. Now, the Spirit of God said to me, before this uh, 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 funeral is carried away, I want you to see what is happening. So I said, all right. Then the, the, the Spirit of God took me near, but then they had already closed the coffin, only leaving the place of the face where you can th see through the corpse inside the coffin. And I was a bit confused because I wanted to see who was in that coffin. But I couldn't. Then I said, who is this? The Spirit of God said to me, observe carefully. Now, as I obeyed, observing carefully, I discovered that the coughing was short. It was short. Now, some may ask, can the coughing be tall or short? Remember, these are spiritual things, and this is a parabolic way of God had to reveal this to me. The coffin was short, and the person inside the coffin was not very clear to me, and the angel refused to tell me the name. But I managed to see the face. And the person had beds, you know. Then I said, God, he looks to be a minister, a preacher. And the Spirit of God said, that's right. He's a minister. Then I said, but he looks fresh inside. He looks young. Why are you taking a, a preacher at such a young age? God said to me, I give life. And I can also take life under circumstances. Then I said to God, God, it is, it, is it your will to kill? And God said to me, no, I don't kill. I simply take. This person has simply switched from one world to another world. He's not dead. But to the face of the world, he's dead. Then I said, Lord, you know, I bombarded God with a lot of questions. I bombarded God with a lot of questions at that moment. You know, I asked as many questions as I could. I said, God, he's a, a, you said he's a preacher. Why so early? God said to me, look, if a person walks in my way, and after walking my way, he's diverting to other ways, because I love him, and I don't want him to end up in hell, it's good for him to take him home before he can make mistakes that will make the devil at last claim his life or his body. You know, I asked many questions, but then 
I was not succeeding. Then I started interceding and praying to this angel of God, this spirit of God who was behind me by my right hand. No, I started praying. Interceding, God said, there is nothing you can do. There is nothing, nothing can happen because I'm the one who has to take him for his own sake. I said, what do you mean by his own sake? That's what I asked God. I said, what do you mean by his own sake? The spirit of the Lord said to me, he will contaminate the body of Christ. I said, what do you mean? He said, God said he's been critical lately. And I don't want him to contaminate the body of Christ. I don't want many souls to be lost. Then the Spirit of God said, remember, when one soul is saved, there is joy in the presence of angels in heaven. So by what he's doing, I'm going to lose many people. And I am not God who is a loser. I'm a God who is a winner. I win a soul. I don't lose a soul. I said, what do you mean? God said, I bind up hearts, not break hearts. What my son is doing is breaking hearts. I couldn't understand, but then I began to understand when God began taking me through the scriptures. Showing me the scriptures. I want you to understand at this point. The topic of a false prophet is a big topic. The topic of a false prophet is a big topic. It's not a topic that you can just say, you know, this one is a false prophet. That is a false prophet. No. Be very careful. You have to understand what it means when the Bible speaks about a false prophet. Who is a false prophet? A false prophet is an antichrist. Now, who is an antichrist? An antichrist is simply means someone who is against Christ. In other ways, it means somebody who is preaching against the doctrine of Christ. Now, the doctrine of Christ is good news. Let me show you something. When you go to the book of Luke, chapter number four, okay? Luke, chapter number four. How do you see this? This was the first ceremony of Jesus. And the first sermon of Jesus was about him revealing his purpose for coming to earth. That was his first preaching. Now look what he said about the reason why he came on earth. Chapter number 4, the book of Luke and verse number 18. All right, verse 17. And the oars delivered unto him the book of the prophet Esaias. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Verse number 18. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel. You see that? He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal broken hearted. I told you Jesus heals. He binds up broken hearted. He doesn't break hearts. He binds them up. So if anything you're doing, you're breaking hearts of some people who believed, who are believers. That's not the gospel. Now watch this. To preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind and set at liberty to them that are bruised to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Look at verse number 19. To preach the acceptable year of the Lord. In other words, to announce that this is the time of prophecy fulfillment. It's called good news. Now, what is good news? Telling people you are a sinner, that's not good news. Telling people you are a killer, that's not good news. Telling a person you are, you know, an adulterer, that's not good news. Jesus said, I've come to preach good news. 
not condemnation. If, 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 in fact, if you read uh, the book of John, chapter number 12, verse number 47, when people were like, did you come to condemn us, to judge us? Jesus said, no, I have not come to condemn you, to judge you. But that through be- believing in me, you must be saved. That's good news. Jesus came to preach good news. And good news, it means, good news does not expose the problem. Rather, good news exposes the solution. That's good news. Good news is to a person who is sick, you are healed. That's good news. Good news is to a person who is lost, you are saved. That's good news. Good news to a person who is poor, you are rich. That's good news. It, it's good news. Not bad news. Good news. Jesus came to preach good news. Not bad news. So anything that comes to you and it is bad news, it's not the gospel. Now, I want you to understand something here. Because... One talk about good news. Okay, f- for example, in the book of Romans, chapter number 14. Uh, in fact, uh, Romans chapter number one. You know, there's something that I want to show you that very quickly. Romans chapter number one. Um, thank you, Holy Spirit. Because, okay, Romans chapter number one. In verse number 16, Romans chapter 1, verse number 16. I want you to see this. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not, I'm not ashamed of condemnation or judgment. No. He says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. He says, what does salvation do? It brings salvation. That's what the gospel does. The gospel does not break hearts. It binds up hearts. It sets free. Okay? So he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. That is the gospel. The gospel is not condemnation. The gospel is not judgment or judging others, condemning others. Exposing others. That is not the gospel. I would like to remind you. A man of God is also a human being first. Before he's a spirit, because the Holy Ghost lives in him. He's first of all a human being. And so as a human being, first and foremost, he also has his own weaknesses. Okay? Now, there's a difference between sin and weakness. Something may be a sin, but something may be a weakness. Okay? A sin, that's a spirit, that's a nature. So sin is a nature. That's a nature, that's a spirit. But a weakness, on the other hand, is something that you are striving to overcome, to get rid of. Okay? That's a weakness. Okay? These two are not the same. I'm not on the topic of sin today, but these two are not the same. So a man of God, as a human being, he also has his own weaknesses. Now, when a man of God is caught or caught in his weaknesses, that does not make him a false prophet. That does not make him a false pastor or a false apostle. No. To be a false prophet, it's a big topic because it means antichrist. It means against the doctrine of Christ. What is the doctrine of Christ? Winning souls. What is the doctrine of Christ? Good news. Good news, that is the doctrine of Christ. So if you are not preaching the doctrine of Christ, that's being antichrist. Because the doctrine of Christ is to win souls, not lose souls. Is to preach good news, not bad news. The gospel is you are sick, now you are healed. You are lost, now you are saved. You are in bondage, now you are free. You are, that's good news. You are poor, now you are rich. You, you are stuck, now you are prosperous. 
It's, it's called good news. You know, you have to differentiate from the time of ignorance that we lived, under which some of us got born again. We, some of us, we got born again under the message of condemnation. I, I remember the, the preachers could stand in front and begin condemning you. You are adulterous. You go to hell. You are killers. You go to hell. You are this. You go to hell. Those were the messages that the preachers preached to us under which <laughs> even myself got born again. But through studying the scripture, I discovered that was not good news. That was a message of judgment. That was a message of condemnation. That was a message of exposure. That was not good news. You see, that, that was not good news. It was judgment. That's not what Jesus wants us to preach. He wants us to preach good news. All right, good news. But now, if I go and start exposing, you know, another man of God, the question is, if I'm exposing another man of God, is that good news? Is that love? You, you know, is, is that good news? You see, the Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 14, verse number 4, who are you to judge another man's servant? That's Romans chapter number 14 and verse number 4. So who are you to judge another man's servant? When God calls me, he called me. I am his servant, not, not someone. I am his servant. If I've got weaknesses, if I've done something wrong, the same God who called me will rebuke me in the way he should have done. He will rebuke me. Now, if somebody discovers my weakness and then goes and begins to expose them, that's condemnation, that's judgment, that's not good news. Now, I want you to see something, just an example. In the book of First Kings, chapter number 11, verse number 33, all right, rather let me pick this. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse number 1. The book of 2 Samuel chapter number 12, verse number 1 to 14. When David, who was a man of God, sinned against God by going into sleep with the wife of Uriah. And then David was a man of God. But he had a witness of women. He had a weakness of women, but he was a man of God. He had a weakness of women, and weakness of women was just one of the many weaknesses of David, which included killing. So, as David was striving in this weakness of women, he went in and slept in one of his soldier's wives, Uriah's wife. And when he did, the Bible says, God spoke to the prophet Nathan. And said, go to my servant David. He has sinned against me. God did not excommunicate David. God did not disown David as his son, as his servant. No. Just because David slept with someone's wife, God did not call David fake or a false prophet. He, but God rather knew that David was also a human being. Therefore, he sent a prophet to go and rebuke David. God did not tell Nathan, you see David, he has slept with another woman. He's a false prophet. Expose him. Then, then Nathan could come on TV and be, you know, began exposing David. David is a false prophet. He's a false man of God. Look, he has gone to sleep with, with, with the wife of Uriah. Nathan did not do that, rather privately. This was a private matter. This was a private weakness of David. Therefore, God sent the prophet, look at what my servant has done. That's bad. Go and rebuke him. Go and rebuke him. And the following morning, the prophet of God, Nathan, you know, came to David running and said, King, that says the Lord, A, B, C, D, put in a parable. And David got angry. He said, you are the one. You have done that. Immediately, David began repent, repenting before God. Listen, Nathan the prophet did not go on TV 
on social media and began exposing David's weaknesses. No, rather, God sent him privately to go and rebuke him. This is how God saves us a hundred. If a man of God has a weakness and God has revealed that weakness to you, or you have seen those weaknesses, it's not for us to start exposing those men of God. Rather, speak to them. It's different from prophecy. Prophecy, we can come and expose it in public. That's prophecy. But we're talking about a rebuke here. Because someone would say, prophet, you give prophecies. Some are bad, some are good. Why don't you, you also go and, you know, talk to them privately? There's a difference. I'm talking about a rebuke. And for that matter, rebuking a man of God. All right? Now, someone will say, no, no, no. They can deserve to be, to, to be exposed because they are false prophets. The question is, what evidence do you have that they are false prophets? Do you know who a false prophet is? A false prophet is someone who is preaching against Christ. He's an antichrist, preaching against the doctrine of Christ. That means someone who is not preaching good news. What is good news? Good news, it is a message that results people unto salvation without condemning them, without judging them, without exposing them. That's good news. You see that? So, so it's a rebuke. And you, in this case, you are a big man of God. This is not a false prophet. When you say someone is a false prophet, what do you mean? That's a big topic. And we should be very careful reader, when we are calling other men of God false prophets. We must, it's a topic I'm normally, I normally close my mouth. I normally don't want to get involved. False prophet? You can't call somebody who preached to somebody and somebody got born again. And you say he's a false prophet? No, no, no. I wonder. How can a false prophet win someone to Christ? Because do you know why I'm saying that? Those people that we're exposing and call them their false prophets, their fake prophets, they what? Those people, don't they have people who are genuinely following them? Don't they have people who, after they saw that prophecy that you call it was a fake prophet, got born again, repented, went back and started following the Lord? We should be very careful on this topic when we call someone a false prophet. Because I want to understand, I'm not saying someone cannot turn from the way of the Lord. It is possible. Someone can turn from the way of the Lord. But that does not make him a false prophet. Be, be very careful. That does not make that someone a false prophet. For example, in this time where people or where servants of God are hungry for power, servants of God are hungry for fame, servants of God are hungry for control, servants of God are hungry for riches. In that age, you see, men of God, most of them become vulnerable to, you know, forsaking the way of God. You know, there are some times whereby a man of God was genuinely caught. He was genuinely caught. But you see, as he was called along the way or along the line, the devil want to put in his tricks and then he will begin to be hungry for power, hungry for control to be the man of God with the big church or the man of God with, who is very rich, man of God. You see, because of those kind of desires in the servants of God, first, it's what find it's what find many men of God diverting from the way of the Lord to seek other gods. Why hungry for power, hungry for fame, hungry for riches, hungry for control? That's the first thing. So the first thing that make many men of God, many prophets, divert from their original calling, it's because of hunger for power, hunger for control, hunger for fame, hunger for riches. You know. Competition, when the spirit of competition enters the man of God, it's a problem. That's the first thing that makes men of God divert from the original core of God. The second thing that makes men of God divert from the original core of God is suffering. It's suffering. Do you know how many men of God are suffering? Suffering to pay rent, suffering to grow their churches, suffering to perform some that they struggle, you know, they struggle to perform a miracle. Some they struggle to prophesy. Some they struggle financially. Financially. Do you know what it means for a man of God to fail to pay rent? To the extent that sometimes a landlord maybe can say, what, what God do you save? Why are you failing to give me my rent? 
it frustrates men of God. It, it, it frustrates, it, it takes men of God to a level whereby they think that maybe I'm not called of God. Because they'll see other pastors, they've got big churches. Other pastors, they are prophesying sharply. Other pastors, you know, they've got control, they've got power, they have, they have got so-called glory in what? And then they're struggling with rent, struggling even to grow their church. They're still in the classroom, the small members or what? You see, the suffering in men of God, it's also another reason that make men of God or servants of God divert from the original call. Because in the process of wanting to deliver themselves from failure financially, struggling financially, failing to pay rent, church rent, failing to pay house rent, failing to pay what, struggle financially, normally the devil will find an opportunity and, you know, penetrates in the servant of God to seek another God. And then at the end, if he is not sticking to his core, he will, or descending the spirits, he will end up, you know, diverting from the original call of God. That's what happens. But that does not mean that person now is a false prophet. But rather, he needs a rebuke. He needs to come back to the Lord. It's very important that we understand this. So, in that case, you do not, you know, expose the person. Rather, rebuke them. And when you rebuke them, be careful. If you are rebuking a man of God, check your attitude first. All right? Don't forget in uh, Numbers chapter number 12, verse number 1 and verse number 9, when Miriam and Moses, I mean Miriam and Aaron came to rebuke, uh, to rebuke Moses, the prophet of God, God got angry. But what Miriam and Aaron was rebuking, you know, Moses for was really true. It was true. But because of the attitude of their rebuke to Moses, God was angry. You know, because of their attitude. And someone says, you shall not profit by their fruits. I understand in the, the book of Matthew, chapter number 7, verse number 15, to verse number 20, the Bible says, talks about that you shall know pro prophets by their fruits. But he did not say, what are those fruits? Because mostly, the fruits talk about here. This was before Jesus resurrected. This was the doctrine of Jesus before the church began. And this, Jesus made this statement while he was still in the Old Testament. Remember, when Jesus was preaching, he was still in the Old Testament until he rose from the dead. The New Testament started when Jesus rose from the dead. That's when the New Testament started. The New Testament did not start from Matthew. Don't be deceived. The New Testament started when Jesus rose from the dead. That means before resurrection, Jesus was still preaching Old Testament doctrine. I want you to remind you that. Jesus was still preaching Old Testament doctrine. That's why the Bible says in the, in, in, in the book of uh, Romans and the book of Hebrews, most of, actually most of the books of the New Testament, the Bible talks about, especially the book of Hebrews, chapter number 5, verse number, we'll go verse number 6 and verse number 7, Hebrews 5, verse 6, 7. The Bible talks about that Jesus was obedient unto death. The obedience talking about that is obedient to the law. It says he was obedient to the law. He was preaching the law. And because, and many times or sometimes when Jesus was trying to forsake from preaching the law to preach the gospel, he had problems with the Pharisees. He had problems with the Sadducees. He had the pro problems with other men of God of, of, of his day. He had problems with, you know, the scribes. So Jesus mostly, most of the things of Jesus before his erection were teachings under the law, were teachings of the Old Testament. But at, at some points, he could try to preach the gospel. But whenever he tried to preach the gospel, he had problems with the law. He had problems with authority. For example, when Jesus healed on the Sabbath day, he had a problem with authority. Why are you healing on the Sabbath day? You see, why are you healing on the Sabbath day? Because in the law, you are not supposed to do good works, healing on the Sabbath day. And the Pharisees says, hey, come on, guys. You can come other days. There are six days you can come for healing, but not on the Sabbath day. And Jesus rebuked them. Why? At this point, Jesus was trying to put grace, was trying to put gospel, but they couldn't understand. So Jesus was still in the New Testament, I mean Old Testament, until he resurrected from the dead. That is why the preachings or the doctrine of the church is in the gospels. I mean, no, not in the gospel, it's in the uh, letters, letters of Paul, letters of John. When you read the letters, that's where you see the doctrine of the gospel. When you, when you study the letters, that's where you see the doctrine of the gospel. 
the gospel is good news, not condemnation. You see, and it was all prophet. Remember, First John chapter four, verse First John chapter four, verse number one to three talks about false prophet. Talk about okay, because in the book of Matthew, in the book of Matthew chapter number seven, verse number fifteen to verse number twenty, Jesus spoke about you shall know false prophets by their fruits. But he did not specify what are those fruits. But then in First John chapter number four, verse number one, verse number three, Jesus specifically speaks about the fruit, the many fruit how you will know a false prophet, and he says if. If the man does not confess that Jesus come in the flesh, he's a false prophet. What does it mean? That's the gospel. That's good news. If he's not preaching the gospel, he's not preaching good news. Or he, if he's preaching against my doctrine, if he's preaching against me, that's a false prophet. Because Jesus knew that a false prophet is difficult to win people to God. So I want you to understand, when a man of God has, a, you know, when a man of God, has a problem. It is for us to pray for them, not expose them, but pray for them. If possible, if God gives us that privilege, we rebuke them with a right attitude. Okay? If I am called by God, if God has called me, maybe I was deceiving people. You know, I was deceiving people before now as God has called me and given me a message. Stick to that message. That's the gospel. Stick to that message. Not, not because I've now repented, now I started uh, exposing other men of God. That's not the gospel. And that's not out of love. God is a God of love. That's not out of love. That, that's not the gospel. If God has called me from my deceitful ways I was doing before, then I must stick to that. Let me win souls. But by exposing other men of God, am I winning souls or am I losing souls? Rather, it's like, it's like winning one soul and losing ten souls in his state. What is that? Gospel, I mean, God is not a loser. Okay? There is a way how God deals with his servants. There is a way. Don't forget. Let me remind you something. If, if, if you read 2 Samuel chapter number 24, 2 Samuel chapter number 24 from verse number 1 to verse 25, the mistake David had done, he, he conducted a census that was not godly, that was not instructed by God, that God did not command. He numbered the people. He commanded his people to, I mean, I mean his soldiers, his people to number the citizens, to number the people. It was not from God. And the Bible says God was angry. God would Track David. Because God was angry with him. Why did you number the people? Without me knowing. God was angry. But you see, look at this now. When God was angry, because David numbered the people without his approval or without his orchestration. Instead, it is the people that died. Hey, please understand how God operates. The people died on the place of David. God was supposed to kill David. He was supposed to strike David. Because he's the one that did that sin. But instead of striking David, killing David for that sin that he did, instead the Bible says thousands of people died that day on instead of David. Understand how God looks at a servant of God. Understand how God looks at a prophet. Many died in his state. You go and read in the, in, in the Bible. Many died instead. That's why in the book of Romans I told you that the Bible says, who are you to judge another man's servant? God has got his own way of dealing with servants when they do mistakes. God has got his own way of, of arriving back to the original core of servants when they divert from the original core. Our job is to pray for them. If a prayer to rebuke, to rebuke them comes, then we have to do so in love, not through exposure, not through judging, not through condemning. We have to do so, you know, we have to do so in love. That's why I told you that there was a woman, uh, when you read uh, John, uh, uh, John, chapter number, John chapter number 3, verse number 17, John chapter number 3, from verse number 15 going down, there was a woman that people found her in the very act of adultery, they caught her having sex. And according to the law, she was supposed to be killed. 
So people began exposing the woman, condemning the woman. But some said, no, let's bring, to Je- let's bring her to Jesus. Let's, let's find out what he's going to say. When they came to Jesus, and then <laughs> Jesus said, tell me, one of you has nobody sinned before. Nobody answered. They ran away because they knew they had sinned before as well. But now they were condemning this one because he was still sinning. She was still sinning. They were condemning her. Because they had sinned before. Jesus said, have you not sinned before? Oh. They were struck by their consciousness. They ran away. And the woman was there before Jesus kneeling alone. Expecting that maybe Jesus was also going to condemn her. Verse number 17, Jesus said, woman, you see now? Did they condemn you? He said, no. Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. He rebuked her in love. Jesus did not expose her. Rebuked her in love. That's the God that we serve. He's a God of love. Let's stick to our core. Let's stick to our calling. If God has given us a message, let us preach that message and definite that message will not be exposing other men of God because exposing other men of God is not from God. What can be from God is to rebuke them in love, in private, if they are servants of God. If we know that they went out of their original call and they're serving other gods, let's pray for them privately, not exposing them in public, or let's you know, find a way to reach them and rebuke them. Not publicly, it's not a spirit of love, it's not the gospel. We are breaking hearts by doing so. We are losing people. God is losing people. Now, if God is losing people, is he going to be happy with us? He's definitely not. I mean, certainly not. He's not going to be happy with us. Because the same person that you call is a false prophet. Someone received a genuine genuine miracle from him. Someone left a a, a Sangoma ship (laughs) through him. He saw a prophet and was like, Wow, so the man of God can't even tell me my name. Hey, the man of God can't even tell me my phone number. Hey, the man of God can't even tell me my address. Hey, hey. See, he went back home. He was having many women. He broke up with them. Started following the Lord. There are some people that through the same thing you call maybe a Facebook prophet, prophecy, you call it a Facebook. There are some people through that same man of God that you're condemning, exposing. But some people have got, have got you know, genuine miracles. There may be other fake miracles, maybe, I don't know. But what I'm saying is, one thing I know is that there are also genuine miracles inside. And some people have been helped. So by us judging them, exposing them, and doing what? You know, we are not winning souls. We are losing souls. And that is not the will of God. We are losing souls. That's not the will of God. We are breaking hearts. Remember, Luke chapter number 4, verse number 18, Jesus said, I've come to bind up brokenhearted. Not break hearts or, or not continue breaking hearts. He said, he came to bind them up, to heal them. Are we healing people? Through our message, are we healing people? We are breaking families. We are breaking hearts. We have to understand what the will of God is. We, exposing other men of God is not going to make us famous. Exposing other men of God is not going to make us any good. Exposing other men of God is not going to make us more holier. The, you know, Christianity is not a jar of holier. Uh, I mean, holier than thou. It, that's not a jar of Christianity. Christianity is not a jar of holiness. Christianity is a journey of faith and a grace, which Jesus wrote on the cross. That's Christianity. Okay, it's, it's not a jar of condemning others, exposing others. It, it's, it's a jar of faith and a grace. The Bible says. We have been saved by grace through faith. You see? In other ways, it is the grace of God. I mean, it is the faith that activates grace for salvation. You see? The grace is there, but we just need to have faith. Once we have faith, that grace is activated and we are saved. That is why you hear here, Romans 1 verse number 16, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God. And to salvation to those that believe. It is the power of God. To them that believe. It is the power of God of salvation. The gospel. In other words, the gospel saves. The gospel wins people to the kingdom. The gospel binds hearts. Blesses. 
That's the gospel. It does not break families. If you're preaching something, you're saying something that is breaking families, it's not the gospel. If you're saying something that is exposing others, it's not the gospel. Please, let's stick to the gospel. Let's preach the gospel. Not exposing others, not who are we? That's what Paul asked. That's what Paul asked in Romans 14 verse 4. Who are we to condemn another man's servant? I, I, hear me, it's, it's not like I don't believe that other men of God, they are serving other gods. I know that. In fact, I never knew until earlier this year. When someone who had that experience spoke to me about it, you know, he told me, he said, ah, you, what are you doing? Your friends are doing things. I remember, I remember. But then I, I, I was staying, I was still staying in Santa. You know, someone approached me and told me, you, what are you doing? You, you don't know nothing. You are just busy preaching. Uh, no, I know people. You know, I answered this person, I said, I would rather have my minister with 20 people than to pursue other gods. That's what I say. I don't want to, pre to preach and after preaching all this labor, all this passion, and then <laughs> I miss heaven. I don't want that. So I told him, I said, I would rather have 20 people in my church than to divert into other gods just to have thousands of people. No. I told him I would rather drive a Toyota Quest than for me to divert into another god in order to drive a Maserati, a Rolls Royce, or a Range Rover. I said, no. But I'm, I'm not trying to say that if you are serving a true God, you can't drive a Maserati. No. I'm not trying to say that if you are following a true God, you can't have a church of thousands of members. It's also possible. But it has to happen organically. It doesn't have to be me following other gods because I want to get rich quick kind of ministry. Because I want power to be the top man of God in that country or in that region or in that. No. It has to happen organically. You see, God gave us different callings and there are limits to those our callings. To some people, God did not call them to have thousands of churches or thousands of members. And so, the, that God will call them to glory with few people. But if they serve in truth and spirit, thanks be to God. Glory to the living God. So, you have to understand what's your call. If God called you not to pastor millions of members or million, thousands of members, stick. Don't try to seek another God. But what I'm saying is, why do other men of God, they divert from the original call? Because I know most of these men of God that we call fake prophet or what, or most of these men of God that may be diverted from the original call. I mean, most of them, they are not fake, they are genuine. They are, believe me, they are genuine, but just that, as I said, the, the, the hunger for power, the desire for control, the hunger for riches, fame, what is what at the end of the day made this people divert from the original call. Let's pray for them, not expose them. So we don't break hearts, because if we break hearts, we have got a case to answer to God. That is why I said, when I saw this vision, when I saw this vision, I started praying, you know, interceding and asking God, God, why have you taken this man so early? God told me, it is good and for his own sake that I do so. And then when that happens, I said, many men of God will be blamed for his death. You know, many will be framed for it. So, will it be other men of God killing him? Or God taking him or whatever. One thing I know. God will allow it. God will allow it. So there is nothing we can do. There is nothing we can do. It is the will of God that this should happen. Thank you very much for following today. I believe you have known the truth. All right, I see a comment here. Very interesting comment. Someone says, you're wasting people's data. We want to hear about the prophets of death. <laughs> see, that, that, that's someone commenting right there. Can you believe that? Someone busy typing, commenting, 
uh, because I'm preaching what the new gospel is and who a, a true false prophet is. Someone says I'm, 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 expo- <laughs> I'm, says I'm wasting their data. Can you imagine? You, you, you see the things that people want to hear. You know, it's amazing this world. It's amazing because <laughs> when a man of God comes and preaches the true gospel, nobody wants to watch. They said that's not newsworthy. Ah, he's not newsworthy. People, <laughs> people wants to watch men of God that they are saying they are newsworthy. You know, so I should fake a miracle, say he's newsworthy or oh, watching. I should fake a prophet, a prophet, say uh, uh, watching. No, I don't do that because that's how people are these days. If you are very critical, many people want to watch you. They want to hear what he's going to say today. Well, they said he's newsworthy. Hey, what he's doing is newsworthy. Hey, newsworthy? It's the gospel that's newsworthy. It's the gospel that's newsworthy. Me exposing other men of God, that's not newsworthy. Me judging other people's servants, that's not newsworthy. The gospel is newsworthy. But that's how people are. You see, this comment is an example, you, you know, how people are. This one said, you're wasting our data. You are really wasting data. You did nothing more than wasting data. <laughs> Good night. Just imagine that. I would laugh again and again and again. This guy expected me to come here and begin judging men of God as well, judging, exposing them. I don't do that. I know why, why God called me. I know my calling. Reuniting men of God in love, with love, preaching the gospel to the lost, win them to Christ. The gospel is good news. The gospel is not you are sick. That's not the gospel. The gospel is you are healed. That's the gospel. Good news. The gospel is not you are poor. Uh-uh. The gospel is you are rich. That's the gospel. The gospel is you, you are poor. Uh, the gospel is you are rich. You are you are, an, you are a kid. The gospel is the result of what you have done. It's because whatever Jesus did on the cross, it was to deal with that power of sin. That's why he died there. You mean Jesus died on the cross for us to come and condemn other people? You think Jesus died on the cross for us to come and condemn servants of God or other people? No. That's not the reason why Jesus Christ died on the cross. No. If me I begin exposing your weaknesses, you, you have got five girlfriends. <laughs> You, you are faking a prophecy. You, you are faking a miracle. You, is that gospel? No. It's condemnation. The Bible says Romans 10 number 8 verse number 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. To those who, are, who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit. And through believing in the gospel, the Bible says we have been made the righteousness of God. In Christ Jesus. For in him we live, move, and have our being. My life. Cross chapter number three. My life is hid in Christ in God. In other words, when God looks at me, he can only look at me through the eye of Jesus. Because I'm hid in his son, in Jesus. So God does not look at me in my weaknesses. No. He looks at me in my, my righteousness. Because I've been made the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. That's how God looks at me. So I can sin today. Right? But God will still not condemn me. He will rather rebuke me in love. That's the gospel. Why? Because he looks at me through the eye of his son Jesus Christ. That's why he sent his son on the cross to die. So that we can be, we can be hid in him. And become the righteousness of God. And qualify for every blessing. Qualify for every healing. Qualify for every prosperity. I pray for you. May the blessing come to you. May healing come to you. Because that's what the gospel does. The gospel does not make people poor. Look what Jesus said in, in, in that, that look, look, look chapter, 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 chapter number 4 verse number, verse number 18. What did he say? Look chapter 4 verse 18. What did Jesus say? In that look chapter 4 verse 18, Jesus said, Okay, let, let, let me, you know, because this thing is like, ah, eh, 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 preaching prosperity is not the gospel. Who told you preaching prosperity is not the gospel? 
Who told you that? Preaching, who preach prosperity, uh, prosperity preachers. Some have been labeled prosperity preachers. No. Prosperity is within the gospel. It's, prosperity is within the gospel. Okay. It's within the gospel. Okay. Verse 18, Luke chapter 4. The spirit of the Lord. Look at what Jesus said. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me, number one. He has anointed me to preach gospel to the poor. He says, he, the first thing Jesus claimed he had come to do says to preach the gospel to the poor. Let me ask you, what is the gospel to the poor? It's prosperity. It's prosperity. What is the gospel to the poor? Because gospel varies. There is gospel to the poor. Gospel to the lost. Gospel to the sick. Gospel to the bondage. So, gospel is good news. So, what is good news to the poor? You are rich. That's good news. Look, you were poor, but now you are rich. That's gospel. So, when he heard the Bible, when he heard Jesus claimed his first point and said, I've come to preach the gospel to the poor. That means he has come to say, you were poor, now you are rich in God. I say, that's the gospel. That's why the gospel, that's why someone who is really preaching the gospel must not be poor. You must refuse to be poor in your life. You must refuse to be stagnant financially in your life. Because it's not in the gospel. You believe the gospel, that's why you are born again now. You believe the gospel. So the gospel to the poor is riches, prosperity. The gospel to the sick is healing. The gospel to the bondage is deliverance. You are in bondage. Now you are delivered. Now you are free. That's the gospel of the bondage. The gospel to the lost is salvation. You were lost and, and you fell short of the glory of God. Now you have been found. Now you are saved. That's the gospel. That's the gospel that must make people come to Christ, receive him as their personal Lord and Savior. Not making them to come to receive Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior through condemning them. Hey, you go to hell because you are a sinner. You go to hell because you are a sinner. You go to hell because you are adultery. You go to hell because... No, that's not the gospel. Let people come to Christ because we have preached the gospel. Let not people come to Christ because we have preached condemnation or exposure or judgment. No. Jesus here claimed that I have come to preach the gospel to the poor. There was a time when, you know, God, that's, that's, uh, that's the first Kings chapter 11, first, first Kings chapter 11, verse 33 and verse number four, four, 34. You know, th th this was the time when someone had many weaknesses, did many evil, more than his father David. And God came and said, the way you have done, I was supposed to destroy you and destroy your kingdom. But he says, because of my servant David, I'm going to preserve you. But after you, I'll divide this kingdom. That's how God deals with his servants. Otherwise, here, here also, God would have destroyed Solomon here. Because the Bible says he did much evil more than his father David. But God said, I can't do that because you're my servant. But he stayed. After you, I'll divide the kingdom. Understand how God deals with his servants. He deals with them in love. He rebukes them. In the book of Revelation, the Bible says, he who God loves rebukes. That's the book of Revelation. It says, he who God loves rebukes. He didn't say he who God loves exposes. No. He didn't say he who God loves condemns. No. He said he who God loves rebukes. The question, those people we are exposing, we are condemning, doesn't God love them? Certainly not. God loves them. So if God loves them, let's rebuke them in love. Not condemn them, not expose them. Glory to God. Okay. Glory to God. Okay. Someone says here nothing but the truth. Yes, this is the truth I'm telling you. Someone says no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Yes. Watching from South Africa, all right. Uh, we are need direction for our ministry, please, Prophet. Okay, no, no, no. All right. Um, okay, okay. So I see many comments. People are understanding what I'm saying here. People are watching from everywhere. This one says, uh, this one is Irene says, I've been moved. No condemnation indeed. Yes, that's it. 
That's the gospel. No condemnation, no exposure, no judging other men of God. That's condemnation. You, you, <laughs> oh, this one is the guy of wasting that. <laughs> He's the only one with that comment. <laughs> Okay, the Bible teaches us that the truth shall set us free, man of God. Yes, that's it. The truth sets free. But now, when you say, okay, exposing another man of God, you said, that's the truth. Uh, people are blaming me because I'm speaking the truth about other men of God. Is that the truth is talking about is the gospel, is the word of God. So don't say, hey, why are you con- I'm exposing false prophets? Why are you condemning me? By me exposing those false prophets, am I not telling the truth? I'm, so you're blaming me, I'm telling... No. question is, what is the truth? In chapter 17, the book of John, Jesus said, the, my word is truth. And his word is a word of love. His word is the gospel. You see? So, <laughs> we don't say, no, I'm saying the truth. The truth there is the word of God. It says, we shall set, be set free when we know the word of God. It says, we shall be set free when we know the word of God. It's true, we shall be set free when we know the truth, which is the word of God. That's why Jesus said, you will know false prophets by their f- fruits. What are their fruits? Their fruits are being said in the Bible. And the first fruit of the false prophet is the one I told you from uh, first John chapter 4 from verse 1 up to 3 when he said for you to know a false prophet he will preach against Christ he will preach against the doctrine of Christ again preach against Christ is preaching not the gospel that means you are preaching condemnation you are preaching judgment you are preaching exposure that's not the gospel the gospel is good news preach to people good news not by so called Tell, saying the truth, exposing false prophets, through that you're owning one, you're only winning one person and losing 60 people. What have you done? You will answer before God. Please check the attitude behind all those things that we are doing. When we come and start condemning other men of God, really, my main question is: what is the motive behind? What is the attitude behind? Do we just want to maintain many people watching us or many people following us? Or becoming famous? No, please. No, please. No, please. This is not the way to go. Let's walk in love as God is, is love. And in him, there is no darkness at all. God bless you. I want to pray for you before I go. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for speaking to your people. Thank you for talking to your people. For you said in the book of First Corinthians, 2 Corinthians that we are ministers of reconciliation. We reconcile, not separate. You said you have given us the gospel, the message of reconciliation. That result into salvation. God, help us to preach good news. To preach reconciliation. To rebuke in love without bad attitude, with good motives for you are not like man who sees outside. You see inside, oh God. Help us, Father. Now, for someone who's watching now and believes in this gospel, I pray for them. If they're sick, they're healed now. If they're broke, miracle money comes in Jesus' name. Opportunities come their way. New connections to them. Open doors. Breakthroughs. In Jesus' mighty name. Healing in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now, thank you very much for following me. I'll be back tomorrow for the midweek service. Until tomorrow, I come your way. Senior Prophet Osnale Bunya here. God bless you. Shalom.